In my last lecture, I talked about the way that Greek philosophy served as a kind of template for early Christian thought and how um, Greek philosophical methodology became part and parcel of the early Christian tradition because of the conversion of Greek educated philosophers to Christianity. Today we're going to look in a similar vein at the way that Roman religious traditions and Roman cult played into the formation of early Christianity and we'll see that the Christian tradition owes an equal amount of debt to Rome as it does to Greece. Now on this title page I have two scenes from the Lupercalia, one of Rome's most important religious festivals which is held on about February 15th of every year. And the two scenes depicted, one scene is a scene where you have young aristocratic men stripping down um, and then running around the streets with leather thongs and whipping people. And the other scene is a scene of orgy. Um, that was a part of the way that they honored their gods. There was also a part of the Lupercalia which involved the murdering of puppies. Yes, specifically puppies, not just dogs and then smearing the blood of those puppies onto aristocratic youths. Um, now, all of this will make sense to a degree when we get into talking about the details of how Roman religion worked. In addition to looking at Roman religion, we're also going to look at some of the cults which were imported into Rome over the course of its history and which had an impact on the formation of Christianity. So what is Roman traditional religion actually like? Well, we get our word religion from the Latin word religio, and that is actually something that they meant as something which focuses on cult practice. So they're only really looking at the kind of rituals and behaviors that people engaged in. It's also worth noting that a cult is not necessarily a group of people who get together and drink Kool-Aid to join the aliens or whatever happened at um, with Jim Jones, but it also is just describes any group of people who meet together and have a shared set of practices that they do on a regular basis. So for instance, um, if you have a class that meets, when you all meet together, if the teacher starts out by taking attendance and talking about something in the news and there's sort of a little ritual to it, then you're actually in a cult. You might not realize it, but you are. Um, don't tell any of your other teachers I told you that, but it's true. Anyway, so for the Romans, the thing that they cared about, as you might have gathered, is ritual. Belief, eh, not so important. In fact, there were plenty of cases where we had act acting priests in Rome who weren't entirely sure whether the gods existed or whether their knowledge of the gods was accurate, but they figured, eh, you know, might as well not take any chances. Let's go ahead and perform these rituals. I mean, seems to be working, so let's just keep doing it. Um, now, one thing people don't realize about Roman myth, because they're so used to um, the norms of Greek myth, is that the Romans only took up the anthropomorphic identity of um, the Greek gods after they had been co uh, in extended contact with the Greeks for a couple centuries. So for instance, Jupiter used to just be a sort of generic sky god represented by lightning and thunder and all that. And then later on, the Romans realized that the Greeks had a similar deity, but he had a lot of personality and his name was Zeus. So they just said, yeah, Jupiter and Zeus are the same. And uh, all the characteristics of Zeus apply equally to Jupiter. Now, um, Roman religion is not based on theory. So whereas the Greeks like to come up with theoretical explanations for things and understand things in a systematic way, Roman religion is based entirely on observation, precedent, and what is known as scientia, where we get our word science, which basically just means practice. So they have no interest in coming up with a theoretical framework in which to fit all the things they do. All they know is that they have tried things and those things work and that's all they care about. They also have professional classes of religious officials which is very different than Greece where officials tended to be um, sort of self-appointed for the most part although there were inherited priesthoods most religious officials in Greece were more um, 
either elected or they were just self-appointed in some way. But in Rome, religion was a professional endeavor, and there were professional colleges of augurs, which were mostly senators, and you also had soothsayers who were from a people called the Etruscans, and they were organized into colleges and guilds, and they would pass down their learning through basically apprenticeships. And that's the thing about authority in Roman religion. It wasn't something that was debated. This is not like Greece. Authority is handed down. You know something's true because someone who is in a position of authority said it's true, and they taught you, and now you'll teach the person after you. There are also some elected offices, like uh, the Pontifex Maximus under the Republic was an elected office, and later it became one of the offices that the emperor held as part of his sort of package of powers. Um, and the Pontifex Maximus is just the chief priest. But it, it because he's mostly in charge of rituals, it's actually less um, spiritual than what we'd normally think of for religion. And that applies to Roman religion as a whole. It's not really all that spiritual by the standards uh, by which we normally think of religion. This, of course, is a picture, a reconstructed picture of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, which is the aspect of Jupiter, which is the best and greatest, and that was the chief temple in Rome for a very long time. This is probably what it would have looked like in its heyday. In addition to sort of the very traditional cults, there also were some new cults that Rome took in. And some of those, like the cult of the mother of the goddesses, which the Romans imported from Asia Minor during the Middle Republic, they would actually give public money to because they thought that the services of this god or goddess were important to their state. Um, one thing that was a sort of standard practice in the imperial period is there was actually a cult of the emperor and people were expected to make a sacrifice to this cult as a way to show their loyalty to Rome itself. And obviously if someone had a religious belief which disabled them from um, making that sacrifice they were considered to be somewhat of a problem which is why some early Christians ran into problems with the Roman state whereas other cults didn't have that issue. Now, it was the emperors and the elite who got to decide which cults were good for public morality and which cults were bad. You might have seen a common theme here where it's basically the elite who get to decide things and the elite who get to hold offices, the elite who get to hand down judgments, the elite who get to smear blood on people and whip people with thongs. That's a very, very common thing in Roman religion and it will remain something that gets passed on to Christianity as well. Now, um, when the cults were to, when some cults were found to be harmful for whatever reason, maybe they were a bit too um, openly sexual for Roman taste. They all thought that such things should be reserved for only a few days of the year, or they didn't seem to be in line with existing traditions, or that maybe they had a teaching that contradicted something in one of the more established cults. Then these things were considered harmful and the Roman state would actually engage in sporadic persecution. And this persecution could take the form of execution, but normally it would take the form of asking people to recant their beliefs, and if they did, they would be spared. Um, there were a, a number of early Christian persecutions, but they were mostly on a very limited scale and very localized. We'll talk about that later when we talk about the specific history of Christianity. Um, this week actually. Now while not all these cults are seen as equal by the state, obviously some get money, some are ignored, and then some occasionally get persecuted. The essential attitude that the Roman state has towards different cults being practiced is that life is an all-you-can-worship buffet. So long as you take a main course of um, the cult of the emperor once a year, you can do whatever the hell you want the rest of the time. And you can favor whichever gods you like, you can join up with oriental cults, you can do whatever you want, just make sure that you're loyal to the emperor. That was kind of the attitude the Roman state had, so relatively hands off, all things considered. So based on the fact that I didn't name any Romans in my last lecture on Greek philosophy, and we also just talked about how the Romans very much favored tradition over theory,
Um, you might be wondering, is there a such thing as Roman philosophy and what does it look like? Well, the answer is yes, there is a such thing and it looks like what we're about to describe. So once again, common theme in Roman philosophy, it's something which is practiced, preached, and executed by the elite. This was also mostly true of Greece, but not entirely. In Rome, it's entirely true though. They, the elite men in Rome, especially during the late Republic period, called themselves the optimates, which means the best men. Um, these are aristocrats who really did believe that they were the best men in the state, morally, physically, and in every other sense. Therefore, they were going to be the ones handing down wisdom from on high. Um, the Romans were not a very, let's say, creative people, and to put it in the most generous term. They were very good at taking other people's ideas and running with them, but they didn't generate many original ideas of their own. And we see that because they take up all of the Greek schools of philosophy and they build on some of them and they have a few famous people who write about these philosophies in Latin. But there are some differences. Um, one thing that the Romans did, which is very typical of them, is they liked a lot of things in the Greek philosophy of Stoicism. However, the thing about Stoicism is that it preached radical equality at first because it was actually founded by a slave in Athens who was then freed. And the Romans liked most of it, but they're not really into all this social liberation stuff. So they took that part out and they kept all the stuff about, you know, maintaining an emotional cool and doing your duty and really um, taking suffering in stride. So they took those parts and built on them, and that became sort of the standard philosophy for most elite Romans from the Republic all throughout the Empire. The only person we have who really talked about um, philosophy in great depth in terms of looking at it as sort of an observer would be Marcus Tullius Cicero, a you know pivotal figure in Roman Republican history. So from him we know how the Romans looked at most types of Greek philosophy. And he also wrote his own dialogues. He wrote something called the Republic modeled on Plato's Republic. But there's a difference. Now in Plato's Republic and in all Platonic dialogues we see the culture of Greece where young up-and-comers can go up and challenge these great figures and tell them they're wrong and try to make an argument and make a name for themselves by defeating an established thinker. In Rome it works a lot differently. So in Cicero's dialogues you'll have a famous Roman from the past like Scipio Africanus, the guy who beat Hannibal. And if there are younger men present, the only function they have is to ask questions to get someone like Scipio to expound upon his beliefs and then they sit in awe at the feet of this great man while he gives them wisdom about the world and about how the world works. Um, to the right of Cicero there is Lucretius. He was probably the most famous Epicurean after Epicurus himself. And he was actually a Roman. So he's a bit of the exception. Um, I always like to point out exceptions just to show you that while there is a general trend in all things, there's, there are always exceptions and eccentrics who can disprove any generic claim. Epicurus wrote a work called On the Nature of Things, and we'll actually talk about that again later in the course because the rediscovery of uh, Lucretius's writings was actually a, an arguably a very important part of the Renaissance. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. So enough about the traditional thought in Rome and sort of Roman elite philosophy. Let's talk a little bit about the religious traditions among more common people and the non-Roman subjects of the Roman Empire. Um, so one thing that was very popular were Oriental cults. Now the word Oriental for the Romans basically just means anything to the east of Greece. Um, so cultures that they considered to be advanced but still barbaric because they're foreign. The elite Romans viewed all of these cults as being emotional. Again, remember, the elite Romans were adherents of Stoicism, which is all about controlling your emotion and doing your duty. And a lot of these Oriental cults involved a lot of noise and 
um, very rowdy processions, and it also enabled lower class people to do things in these rituals. So if you'll recall, the Lupercalia was all about aristocrats running around and doing stuff while common people just got hit with leather thongs. In an oriental cult, a lot of times equality was a thing that was the rule. So a fairly lower class person could be a high ranking official in an oriental cult sometimes. And for that reason, and because it was new and novel and there were really no rules against joining these things, uh, you know, a lot of the Roman lower classes would get into them. Um, after all, it's a new thing, it's a diversion, it's fresh, it's exciting. Maybe there are new teachings there that you've never heard, so you can learn some new stuff. A lot of these cults tend to focus very heavily on spiritual egalitarianism, the idea that even if we're not equal in life or in terms of our skills as, say, a citizen, uh, we are equal as humans in the eyes of the gods. Obviously, you can get why a Roman elite would not like that idea. Um, there also a lot of these have afterlives. Uh, that's something that was somewhat new in antiquity. Early Judaism didn't have an afterlife, and it looks, so far as we can tell, traditional Greek and Roman religion didn't really have much of a firmly developed concept of an afterlife either. And the idea is that if you uh, participate in this cult long enough and really kiss up to the priest, you'll get some secrets revealed to you, and that gives you the leg up. So it's kind of like um, DLC in modern video games. If you put in the time and effort and money, you'll get a leg up on the competition, and you can then go brag to your friends that you're a level 5 in this cult rather than a level 3. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's got an appeal to it that um, allows you to be something in this cult that you can't really be in your normal life. Now, these things also tend to be very faddish. So these tend to come and go pretty rapidly, um, mostly just dying out of their own accord and not because of any kind of persecution or anything like that. And for the most part, when a new cult will be introduced to the city of Rome, it will you know, flare up and become a thing, and then within 20 years it's basically gone and it's been displaced by something newer and more exciting. And that's a pretty common pattern in the Roman world from the early empire until approximately the end of the empire. So what are some specific examples of these cults? Well, I'm going to give you two examples. The first example is the cult of Isis. Now, Isis was an Egyptian goddess who dated back um, in Egyptian history, so technically the worship of Isis is far older than any of the Greek and Roman religious practices that it would rival. And during the Hellenistic period after Alexander's conquest, when Greeks settled in heavy numbers in Egypt, they took up Isis, but they Hellenized her to be the equivalent of the grain goddess Demeter. Demeter, of course, has a lot of influence on harvest. And if you see the statue of Isis here, she looks a lot more like a Greek or Roman goddess than an Egyptian goddess, and that's because she's been appropriated by the Greeks and then adopted by the Romans, who just automatically appropriated anything the Greeks did. So uh, cultural appropriation is not a new thing. Now, for the Greeks and the Romans, her, she was a lot different than she was for the Egyptians of old, and for Greeks and Romans, Isis was a goddess who offered an afterlife, and a pretty good one too. So she held out a lot of appeal, and her appeal was actually something which was broad. It, it appealed to people of all genders, classes, um, it appealed across cultural lines, it was something that uh, lasted beyond the 20-year cycle that most of these things ran in, and it was something which occasionally did get some imperial patronage. Um, Caligula, who is mostly just known for being insane, was a devotee of Isis, and then the dynasty which succeeded the Julio-Claudians, the Flavian dynasty of Vespasian, also gave the cult of Isis quite a bit of imperial patronage. And this cult would survive all the way until at least the 4th century, and possibly a bit beyond that. Ancient Egypt is one source of an oriental cult, but most of them, if our sources are to be believed, actually came from either Persia or places to the east of Persia. 
And the most successful cult that we know was definitely Persian was the cult of Mithras. Now, um, this is a mystery religion just like Isis. The deeper you get into the religion, the more time you invest in it, the more that is revealed to you and the sweeter the rewards package in the afterlife is. Um, the cult of Mithras started in the first century and it was popular well into the fourth century. Um, and the main constituency for the cult of Mithras was uh, the Roman army. So lots of soldiers would be devotees of Mithras. Um, now Mithras also offered an afterlife and apparently there were a lot of warrior connotations with Mithras. He's often depicted either hunting as here or at war. So I guess the idea would be that if you serve Rome loyally and die in battle, then Mithras would be the god who would have your back and make sure that you're rewarded in the next world. And in terms of the way it's structured, in terms of priesthoods and um, the way people are recruited and stuff like that, the cult of Mithras is a lot more similar to Christianity than to Persian religions like Zoroastrianism. So even though it started out in Persia, it was very thoroughly Romanized and um, had become something that was much more popular in the Roman world than in Persia where it originated. And it's also worth noting that because of the similarities in the way that the religion itself was run as an institution to the way that Christianity was run, um, the way the Christian church operated was not necessarily unique or exclusive during the Roman world. Like a lot of other religions operated on pro approximately the same way in terms of having uh, you know, religious officials and communities and having uh, meeting houses and all that. That was pretty much the way that religions worked in the Roman world. And Mithras was sort of maybe even a template for setting up the Christian church to some extent. And while we're on the subject of Persia, we might as well bring up Zoroastrianism. So this was the most common faith in the Persian realm from about 600 BCE when they had the Achaemenid Empire, the one featured in the 300 movies, all the way until 650 CE when we have the Sasanian Persian Empire falling to the Arab invasions. So um, the supreme god of Zoroastrianism is a god called Ahura Mazda and he created the universe. He has two children who are respectively the source of all good and all evil in the world. So that gives us a good evil dichotomy kind of like Christianity with God and Satan. Um, obviously the prophet of Zoroastrianism is a guy named Zoroaster. That's where the name comes from. Now Zoroastrianism is a little bit hard to pin down. Theologically it was fairly diverse and flexible kind of like the Roman religion and it's something which no doubt evolved quite a bit over the long 1200 years of its existence but there were was a lot of continuity in it and if you take a world religion class there's no doubt that Zoroastrianism would come up and so far as I'm aware there is currently a revival of Zoroastrianism in modern Iran so I find that kind of interesting and I recommend you check that out if you're interested in learning more We'll probably revisit Zoroastrianism when we come back to Persia in a couple weeks to talk about the Byzantine-Persian War and then ultimately the conquest of Persia at the hands of the Arab invasors. Earlier in this presentation I might have given the false impression that all Roman elites were totally satisfied with traditional religion. Plenty of them entered some of the cults we talked about earlier. But for the educated, sort of uh, critical thinking types, there were more philosophical routes they could take. And for most of them, by the late Roman Empire, so the period where we're starting around 300 or so, they would have turned to schools like Neoplatonism. Now, I have absolutely no intention of explaining the details of Neoplatonism. It's somewhat hard to define. And... If you really want to learn about it, you'd probably have to either read some extremely arcane text or else uh, go to grad school and write a dissertation on the topic of Neoplatonism. Uh, keep it concise, 
The Neoplatonists claimed that they were an evolution from Plato, pictured to your immediate and the, well, in the center of your screen. But in reality, Neoplatonism was more or less an amalgam of almost all of the old schools of Greek philosophy, and then they just sort of put Plato at the top, but they would also use ideas from the Stoics and Aristotle and a bunch of other schools as well. Now, you might think that this would be a super rational thing. I mean, you're combining all of these great philosophers, people we normally look at in like world civ classes and history of philosophy classes, and we think of them as beacons of rationality in a sea of superstition. However, when Neoplatonists looked at people like Plato, they thought there were hidden meanings in the text and that you could access secret knowledge from the gods if you engaged in weird rituals. So a lot of Neoplatonism was actually very mystical, and a lot of the philosophers of this period dressed in ways not dissimilar to what we think of uh, as being appropriate for fantasy Disney wizards. And no, that is not a joke. That's literally how a lot of these people did dress. And one of the things about Neoplatonism is that it did have a big intellectual impact. Um, however, it's not very accessible. The teachings are extremely arcane and weird. This appeals to people who are, one, educated enough to take the time to learn all the philosophy needed to understand it, but then, two, they have to also be very eccentric to actually like this kind of stuff. So the appeal is very narrow. And the ultimate example of why this thing is so narrow is the guy on the right of your screen, Plotinus, who wrote a work called The Aeneids. Um, the Aeneids is literally impossible to explain, and very few people, if any, actually understand it. I personally have only met one person who claims that he understands what Plotinus was talking about, and I'm 100% sure that that person is a complete and total charlatan. No one understands Plotinus. I doubt anybody understood him back then. That stuff is literally impenetrable. And that is why Neoplatonism is not a modern religion. So, now that we've discussed both traditional Roman religion and Neoplatonism, let's revisit what I talked about last week with late paganism under Julian the Apostate. You'll recall that Julian had an interest in creating sort of a unified pagan church and that he tried to really revive uh, pagan practices. He ultimately failed because if you look at the date of his reign, he was only on the throne for about 18 months, and he died in battle, he had no heir, and uh, that was it for him. The end, uh, in terms of having a pagan emperor and having state funding for the various cults of traditional Roman religion or non-Christian belief. Now. Um, to give an idea of what religious tension was like by about the time of Julian in the 4th century, it's worth noting that most of the sources that are contemporary or close to contemporary with Julian blame Christian and piety for all of the empire's woes, and one common attack that pagans made on Christians is that they were atheists, and the reason for that is because Christians only worship one god. For pagans, that was atheism because you're denying the existence of all the gods, or at least the vast majority. So they would call these Christians atheists for that reason. Um, now, the thing is, paganism didn't die with Julian. It lingered on for a long time, and there were plenty of intellectuals who were very conservative, I guess you could say, in terms of uh, adhering to the beliefs and gods who were mentioned in texts that they loved. So up until at least the 6th century, there were sort of closeted pagans in government and teaching in places like Athens. Um, a quick note about the term pagan. We normally think of it as something which is a given. You know, we think of pagan as a term which makes sense and has a definite identity. However, it was actually invented as a pejorative. Um, early Christianity spread first in cities and only slowly penetrated the countryside. So by the time we get to the very end of the Roman Empire, beginning of the Middle Ages, um, city people would be Christian and they would look at non-Christians as basically being rednecks. 
So they would use the term Paganos, which basically just means redneck, to describe the people who are not yet Christian. And then that sort of term is translated in English as pagan, and is just sort of applied as a blanket to all non-Christian religions, which are also not Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or part of any other currently existing slash numerically prominent group. And a lot of these traditional or cult practices that we've talked about above lasted in a lot of rural areas until at least the 8th or 9th century, and we can tell that from archaeology and finding little statues and votives and all kinds of things which show that these cult practices were continuing in various areas. Shockingly, and I was being sarcastic when I said shockingly, most of these pagan practices that persisted involved agriculture. I mean, if you're a farmer, you don't want to abandon things that have worked in the past, right? Kind of only makes sense. By way of summary, let's briefly revisit what Roman traditional religion and Oriental cults contributed to Christianity. On the Roman side, the tradition of elite dominance, the idea that members of rich and powerful families should always be the front men, spokesmen, and chief thinkers of the religion would hold true for many, many centuries, down until at least the 20th century. Um, there's a focus on deriving your authority by tradition and office rather than on, say, thought or on um, argumentation. This is in contrast to the Greek system where you did have to have some backing and tradition, but ultimately argumentation could carry the day. Um, this will be a tension within Christianity, and we'll actually see, interestingly enough, how that plays out based on the east-west divide of the empire. Um, we also see that the Romans were pretty comfortable with state-level interventions and regulations of religion. Whereas in the Greek tradition, this was much less the case. Um, on the side of Oriental cults, we see that there are open appeals to the downtrodden in Christianity. Uh, early Christians actually made efforts to appeal to the poor and do things to help alleviate their suffering in the material world. There's also a heavy focus on the afterlife, which is mostly inspired by the success of things like the cult of Isis, which also talked about these things that were central to people's concerns. And there also is a ritual role for commoners. Commoners also do things like taking the Eucharist. Um, in traditional Roman religion, you would never see that, but in an Oriental cult, everyone takes part in these rituals which help honor the gods. So that is sort of a basic summary of the things which Roman and Oriental religions contributed to Christianity going into late antiquity in the Middle Ages.